I had finally reached a breaking point. My family and I were being attacked by these things day and night for months, and the activity was only increasing. And I was scared not only for myself, but for my wife and our daughter. And even worse, I knew it was my fault. I was the one that invited these things in. Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Sharpening Report. I am your host, Josh Beck. I've gotten a few requests over the years to talk about something that's a, a part of my testimony, but something that, that happened to me uh, years ago. And I've, I've talked about it kind of here and there, but I haven't dedicated a full episode to it, so I wanted to do that today. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. Basically, when I lived in the most demon-infested place that I, I can imagine, what led up to it, how it's how it all stopped, um, and even a couple other things that that came out of it later. And I think that this can be helpful for a lot of people, especially since so many people today, and it seems like the numbers are increasing, suffer from sleep paralysis and uh, and and demonic attacks during sleep paralysis. I'm, I'm going to talk about all that and just kind of my experience with this, and uh, and also. Um, something else that has really infiltrated the world is a lot of new age practices and beliefs, especially, or I should say, even in the church, even in uh, people that call themselves Christians. And I, I was one of those. And I've, uh, I've, I want to talk about coming out of that and uh, why that stuff is so dangerous and what all happened. So to begin, I guess I'll just start at the beginning. I, I had a, I did have a Christian upbringing. Uh, I was raised in a, uh, a Baptist church, but when I was a kid, um, a lot of weird things would, would happen. A lot of, a lot of, I didn't know how to interpret it at the time, but, um, and, and some of it, I don't remember at all, but, um, I remember, uh, some of the stuff I do remember. I remember being scared of hearing voices at night. Um, I remember one time I woke up in the morning and my uh, my mom, I believe my dad, and my next door neighbor were talking in my backyard. So I went out there to see what was going on and every blade of grass had been pushed down in, in, in the yard. Like the entire, the entire backyard was just flat. It was the weirdest thing ever. And nobody could figure out what would cause that um, because it was only in our yard. It wasn't in the neighbor's yard. And it wasn't like patches of, of places that the grass was uh, pushed down because this was in Michigan and we did have some woods by sort of by our house. And so the theory was, well, maybe a, a herd of deer came in and laid down and then left. But it didn't look like that. It, it, it was every blade of grass was just flattened. Um, so that that was really weird. <laughs> um, some of the things that I don't remember, uh, my, my mom uh, remembered that I apparently had an invisible friend that was a little girl. I have no memory of this, but um, she said that I would talk to her and then like play with her all the time and stuff. But there was this one night that my mom was sleeping on the couch and she said that, or, or she, had, she hadn't fallen asleep yet, but she was about to. Um, and she said that as she had her, as she had her eyes closed, she felt like a small hand grab her hand and and it shook her it shook her awake uh but when she woke up there wasn't anybody there it, it it wasn't me um there was just nobody there um when when uh when some of this stuff was going on especially after the the grass incident this is another thing i don't remember but i was told years later that um i was uh apparently really afraid of a monster in the backyard whatever that means. Uh, I don't, I don't remember this, but it wasn't like, you know, a monster under the bed or in the closet or any of the normal things. It was, it was the backyard that uh, apparently as a kid, as like a little kid, um, I was really, really, really afraid of. Well, my mom, um, my mom ended up, I, okay. So I was raised in the church, but it's not like my, my mom didn't have the strongest theology. And then my dad just wasn't a Christian at all. My, my dad was just he, he's actually probably the most evil person I've ever met in my life. Um, I, I don't have any relationship with him, but he he was he wasn't a Christian. He was really abusive. Uh, he he was horrible. But um, my mom was brought up in the church, but she didn't have the strongest theology in the world, um, and neither did I at the time. Uh, but 
Uh, so after the grass thing had happened and other, other weird things were going on in the house, um, my mom invited a psychic over to, to try to see what was going on in the house. And the psychic said that there were three ghosts in the house and then a malevolent presence in somewhere in the backyard. And then that was all she really said. So I don't know how much help that really was. Um, but so, you know, even though my mom was technically a Christian, she still kind of believed in like psychics and this, this kind of stuff. Um, there, there was, uh, one time my mom admitted to me that again, this was years later, um, that when I was, I, I don't know how old I was, this, this, this must've been, I was either too young to remember or before I was born. But my mom said that in that house, there was one night that she got really drunk and started messing around with a Ouija board. And then after that, that's when all the weird stuff in the house would happen. I, I remember my, my dad would say that he would, uh, he would like ask, ask the spirits for a sign a lot. He was like, like obsessed with it and he would see stuff move and it just gave, gave him like a big thrill and all this. Um, Never minding the fact that I was having night terrors. I was scared at night all the time. I remember that pretty vividly. Um, but uh, th there was there was another another time that uh, my mom, she would have this big rock in front of her uh, bedroom door to keep the door open. And um, I mean, this rock was huge. Like I couldn't lift it on my own. There was one time where uh, middle of the day, um, my mom's door just slammed shut, like it, it, like as hard as you can imagine, like o almost to the point where you would think the thing would break off the hinges. And when my mom went in there, the rock had been moved further into the room, like by a few feet, and and the door was closed. So um, so that that was really weird. So that was like kind of my childhood, but but the problem was at the time. My mom admitted all this stuff years later. At the time, my mom didn't really talk to me about it. My mom didn't tell me that she had had sleep paralysis episodes, too, because I was having sleep paralysis when I was a kid, although it, it didn't have a name like that at the time, at least not that I was aware of. I didn't hear the term sleep paralysis till years later. Um, but uh, my mom wouldn't talk to me about it, and I think she was just worried about scaring me. But um, after after I was much older, she did admit that she she had frequent sleep paralysis attacks a lot um well at the time when i would ask the pastor of the church about what was going on just about demons demon attacks you know i tried to describe the sleep paralysis but again it didn't really have a name back then um and, and by the way for those who aren't familiar with it sleep paralysis is a condition where uh basically your body falls asleep but you're you're you remain you remain conscious and aware so you can't move there is a technical medical explanation for what goes on with brain chemicals and stuff but it seems like there's a spiritual component too because a lot of people get attacked like th this is never a pleasant experience you're paralyzed you can't move you you feel a, a fear and a sense of doom unlike any that you 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 can imagine um and it's and th and then either you may or may not see something you may or may not hear anything um but you know every every sleep paralysis instance is is different so that's basically what it is. But when I would ask the pastor about it, I, I never really got a real answer from anybody in the church, um, really any Christian. Uh, I just didn't, I didn't get a good answer. And instead of my, my issue with it was instead of just saying, you know, I really don't know about that, Josh, that, that sounds really horrifying. Um, instead of that, uh, the, the kind of answers that I would get is, you know, oh, well, you know, maybe you just had you just had something to eat that was weird the other night. It's probably just bad dreams. It's a child's imagination. You know, it's, it's just that kind of stuff. And, and then and it wasn't just that stuff. Um, it was it was actual, you know, theological questions, too. Like I would ask, like, what about aliens? Like, can you know, does the Bible allow for the existence of aliens? Can, are, are, could aliens be real? And then they would say, oh, Josh, all that's just demons. And I'd say, okay, you know, fine, but wh where do we get that from? Like, how, how do we know that? And then they would, they would say, uh, you just got to take it on faith. That was like the go-to answer that I would get all the time is you just got to take it on faith. And it was clear, even as, even as a really young child at the time, it was clear they don't know. And they just don't want to admit that they don't know, which bothered me. Um, so be, that being one of the reasons 
Um, but at, uh, at 12 years old, my mom and I moved out of that house, um, got away from my dad, which they were already divorced and I already didn't see him much, but, uh, uh, but we, we moved in with who would become my, my stepdad and my mom, she didn't have a, she didn't know of like a church there or anything. And she just, she just gave me the option at 12 years old. She just said, Josh, you know, if you want to stop going to church, we don't have to go anymore. And, you know, I was still very much a Christian, but I didn't want to go to church. I mean, you know, I was 12 years old and at the church that I was in, I really liked the people and still do. I, I have, I have a much better view. I have a much better memory of the church now than I did when I was a kid. When I was a kid, I was just kind of, I was kind of upset and that I wasn't getting any answers for, from anything. And, that what I thought were really important questions were just kind of being brushed off and just acted like it wasn't anything important. I, I, I didn't really like that. So I, so I assumed all churches were like that. Unfortunately, many are, but I, I don't, I, I have more fond memories of, of the church now. I mean, I, I don't, they're, they are the ones that introduced me to Jesus. Nobody there was like mean to me or anything. Um, it was just that one thing, but, but I used that as an excuse in my own mind to decide to stop going to church. So again, I was still very much a Christian. I just didn't want to go to church anymore. Um, and but then I, I started having sleep paralysis, like like really bad. Like when when I turned twelve, it was like something happened where like the sleep paralysis like really like went up. Um, a lot of the other paranormal stuff that seemed to be occurring in that house didn't. It didn't seem to follow us to like new house or anything. There there really weren't. There wasn't any like paranormal stuff that happened at my stepdad's house. The only thing was my sleep paralysis. And then what I would find out later, my mom was having sleep paralysis too, but she didn't, again, it took her years to tell me about that. Um, so one of, one of the, one of the worst ones, one of the scariest ones. And, and when, before I was 12, like I would have sleep paralysis, but I don't really have like memories of it. I know that it happened, but I don't have like specific memories of a lot of this stuff. Actually, before I was 12, there, there's a lot of years where I don't, I don't remember a lot. Um, and I, I don't know why. Uh, I just have I just there's big gaps that I can't remember anything. But I, I just I just kind of know that it happened. But um, I think back then it was kind of more general. And then after I had turned twelve and we moved, uh, uh, it it got it got really really intense. So there was one. Um, I always slept with my door closed because uh, we had cats and the cats would come in and wake me up at night. So I always had my door closed. Um, and I remember I was laying on my, uh, I, I was, I was kind of laying, laying down and I was sort of facing the door and, um, I don't know if I was asleep at first or if I just went right into sleep paralysis. Uh, but however it happened, I, I couldn't move, couldn't say anything, could, couldn't do anything. Um, and I started hearing the, the, this shuffling coming, uh, from outside my door. I saw the doorknob turn and open and in walked in this, it, it I don't know, it, it had, it had some kind of cloak with a hood over it. So I didn't get really good look at its face, but from kind of an outline, I could, I could sort of tell it had like a, a long, like a really long face, but I couldn't make out any definite details or anything. And this, this thing kind of shuffled in. I, I mean, it was all black. It looked like it had a big black cloak covering it and this big black hood um and it it sh kind of shuffled in and it turned around and it stared at me and and when it looked at me i just got like it was like hatred was emanating off of this thing and i could i i could just feel it and it, it was horrifying so then it brought it brought up something like this uh it was holding something like this and i looked at it and it looked like a like a knife or a dagger or something and um, I was I was kind of laying on my back with my head turned to the left towards the door, and this thing leaned over, put one of its hands on the bed, and I actually felt the bed like, like I felt the bed like uh, where it was putting weight on it actually like dip down. I, I felt that, and that that was horrifying because it was like telling me this is real, this is a physical thing, this isn't just some dream, like everybody's been telling me that these were just dreams. 
that this this was something actually physically happening here and i remember praying and praying and praying in my head like asking jesus for help and at this time i didn't know anything about spiritual warfare i didn't find that out till years later but i'm getting a little ahead of myself um so with its other hand that had the knife it it drove it right into it right into my side and pulled it across and i i remember closing my eyes and just like waiting for the pain but i didn't feel pain i just felt it just felt kind of tingly um and so I opened my eyes, it pulled the knife out, and it, it looked at the knife, and it looked at me, and then there was another wave of hatred and anger and disgust, like, towards me. It, it, it was like it was angry that it was trying to hurt me, but for some reason I wasn't being hurt. And then it then it turned around, and it shuffled out. And, uh, and then I don't remember anything till the next morning. So I don't know if I was so scared that I just passed out, or... I can't imagine that I would have fallen asleep after that. I, I don't remember anything till the next morning. So the next morning, I uh, I woke up. It was bright daylight. I had full memory of everything that happened. And my door was open. My door was left open. And so I went out and I asked my stepdad and mom if they had... Because I, I was trying to make sense. And, and again, I had been told by everybody that these were just bad dreams. So uh, I asked them if they had opened up my door at night and both of them said no that they didn't touch my door it was open when um when i got up and they assumed that i just forgot to close it uh, so that was that was basically the end of that one uh absolutely terrifying that one stuck with me for a long time there was another time and, and these would happen frequently like the, these would happen well at that time maybe once or twice a month um but as time progressed, it would increase. Um, but there was another time where uh, my bed was in a different place at this time. This was this was a ways later, and I was um, laying in bed uh, again on my back, uh, facing the door, and I was having sleep paralysis. And um, this time, my door was open because at this at this time, I, I was sleeping with my door open. I didn't care about the cats anymore. Um, and uh, somebody that looked exactly like a friend of mine um, that, that I went to school with at the time uh, came into the doorway, looked at me really angry, said something that uh, this, this friend of mine was known to, to say. Um, usually he'd say it as, as a joke, but uh, when, when this thing said it, and I knew it wasn't my friend, I knew it was something impersonating my friend. When, when this thing said it, it sounded really sinister. And then, uh, then the thing that that looked exactly like my friend ran jumped on top of me grabbed me and like just shook me like 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 really violently shook me um by my shoulders and so i mean i was like up out of bed being being shaken and, or, or like sitting up kind of i wasn't like out of bed but i was like sitting like i was being i was being made to sit up and being like shaken really bad and um that violent shaking kind of shook me out of it and when I when and then then I was out of it, um, but I remember that because I I was pretty young when that happened, maybe fourteen or fifteen, and I remember telling one of my one of my friends about it who who wasn't Christian but was willing to talk about weird spiritual stuff like that, um, and she was like, well maybe that's a sign that you need to you know stay away from it, and th this this person was like one of my one of my best friends, and. I get where she was coming from, but that just didn't seem right to me. Um, and because it's like, why, why would that be a sign to stay away from them? And like, I mean, I, I get, I get why somebody would make that connection, but, um, you know, could, couldn't it be that I actually had a really good friendship with this person? Cause this person was a Christian, uh, still is. And I, I had a really good friendship with this person and I'm leaving names out of this just cause I don't want to, you know, I don't want to embarrass anybody, but, um, and this, this friend, I don't even think I ever told him about this, but, uh, but to me, it, it was like, well, if it, if it was a demon, couldn't the demon be trying to get me to stop my friendship with this guy because he's a Christian and he's a good influence on me. Um, so I didn't, uh, I didn't take it as a warning. I stayed friends with the guy and we, we, we had a great friendship still do. Um, and uh and never had any serious problems or anything like that so 
so that so that happened. Um, so this whole time, I mean, I, I I went through this in middle school and high school, and didn't really have a lot of people to talk to about it. There were times that I would try, but it's just you know, like kids didn't really know what to make of it, and um, I, I just I just kind of learned that that th this is this isn't something that I can just talk about. So um, so after after that uh, at eighteen. When I was 18 years old, I moved out and I moved into another friend's house with their family and the sleep paralysis attacks continued and they even got worse. Like they really ramped up where I was having them maybe once or twice a month. Now I was having them three times, four times a week. I mean, it was, it was getting really, really bad. I remember one of them. So the friend that I was with, it was, uh, uh, my friend, her couple of sisters, uh, and then their mom and their dad. And um, their dad had an alcohol problem. I got along with him fine, but um, I, I, I seemed to get along with everybody there fine. But he had an alcohol problem that I didn't, and there were specifics about it that I didn't know. So this this one night, um, I had like this three-part false awakening, full sleep paralysis thing. So... The first one, so I, I was in sleep paralysis, and I tried to just close my eyes, uh, and I tried to just kind of try to sleep through it, because when I first got to sleep paralysis, nothing scary was happening yet, and I thought, you know, maybe maybe if I can just close my eyes and, and try, to, try to sleep, you know, try to force, like, a dream or something, like, try to sleep, maybe that will, maybe that'll work, because I had never tried that before. Uh, and it was horrible. I, like I, I, I wouldn't recommend that. That that was a very bad idea. So, um, I so I did that. I thought I had fallen asleep, and I thought I woke up. So I, I thought I was awake. I got up, got up out of bed. I my uh, my room was in the basement. I went upstairs, and then um, they had all these like these windows in their kitchen and stuff, so you could see outside really clearly, and everything was solid like colorlessness like i guess it would be like gray or beige or something but even that even that's more colorful than this was this was like it wasn't like black it wasn't dark um there was there was some light but it was it was just i, I can't even explain it it was just like colorlessness and and empty and and just void and and then i got i got really really scared and then i opened my eyes again and i thought oh, okay now i'm awake for real well then i went upstairs and my friend's dad was what uh, was was drinking a particular kind of alcohol in a particular kind of way that I didn't know that he drank that because I, I actually never really saw him drink. Um, but um, and he was being really abusive and like me and my friend had to like hide from him like almost like we were little kids again. It, 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 like it was just weird and. Uh, and then that was going on, and then I woke up again. What I what I what I thought I I thought I woke up again. I opened my eyes. And I was like, oh my gosh, okay, finally. Hopefully this is done now. Um, and I turned around, and then my my friend that I was living with was sitting on the floor, just just kind of smiling and saying weird stuff and laughing at me. And somehow i just i knew it wasn't her i knew it was another one of these things where something was impersonating her but now i could actually move and um so i got i, I got up and i grabbed this thing's head and I, I smashed it into the wall as hard as i could and then when i looked again uh the, the thing whatever it was was just laughing at me but it didn't look like my friend anymore it looked like some total stranger some completely different person it was just laughing and laughing and laughing so i did it again then I opened my eyes again. Um, that this time, this time I actually woke up for real. Uh, and when I, I was laying there facing straight up, and I saw this this, it was like a three dimensional shadow. It was like a, a humanoid form floating a couple of feet above me in the exact position that I was laying in, uh, just just flipped around facing me. And um, it was humanoid, featureless. Like it was like a three-dimensional shadow, and that scared me so bad. Uh, I I got out of bed. I tore upstairs, ran upstairs to the the, the very top part of the house. It was like a, I think it was like a three-story. It was a two-story house in a basement. But I went up to the top story. There were some couches up there, 
and uh, for a while I just slept up there. Uh, so, so that that was horrifying. I I had while I was there I had a lot more. I mean, again, this was happening like a, a couple of times a week, like two or three times a week, sometimes more. Um, to, to the point where I was, I, I would stay up at night even. Like, I, I would I would just force myself to stay awake. There were times I would I would be awake for two or three days before I just, I just could, I just absolutely had to sleep. Um, so it was, it was terrifying. Um, my, the, the, I, I did end up telling my friend about it and they were Catholic. So they said they, there was a whole bunch of crucifixes and stuff in the basement. And they said, try putting those all around your bed. And I did, and it didn't work. If anything, it made it worse. Um, it, it didn't do anything. Uh, but, but again, I didn't. I didn't know. Um, I didn't know what to do. So, uh, so then, after after living there for a while, I ended up moving out, and um, and I, I kind of went from place to place for a while. But uh, one of them, I moved in with uh, another couple that I had worked with, a couple who were dating. And I worked with them, and um, the the girlfriend. I like when I was when I had moved in. I, I told her about the sleep paralysis because I said, you know, I don't know when these things happen. I try to make noise, and usually I can't. But sometimes, like, you know, I'll, I'll get out some little little noises or anything. Like, just if you hear that, it's I'm just basically treated as a bad dream. Um, I don't know what would happen if you came and tried to wake me up. So it's probably best to just leave it alone. I don't know. Um, well, I, it turns out she, she was really into new age stuff. And when I told her about the sleep paralysis and stuff, she asked me if I had ever heard of astral projection. And I said, no, what's that? Um, and she said, well, it's, it's a method that, uh, people believe you can will your consciousness out of your body. So if you're, if you learned how to do that, you know, maybe while this was happening, you could, you could leave your body and defend yourself and actually be able to do something about it. And so at, at the time I didn't have any other options and I, I didn't know what else to do. So I said, okay. And she gave me a book about it, like how to do it. And, um, for like the next six months, like that, that book I read from cover to cover, got really obsessed with it. Um, practiced it. Uh, I even became, <laughs> <laughs> which is funny now, but like I, I even became a vegan because it said it said in the book that you'd have a better chance of, of doing it. And um, I practiced it for about six months before it, it actually worked. Um, and by this time, by this time I was getting, I was just so obsessed with it. And that, that was my introduction to new age. Um, I was so obsessed with it. It, it wasn't even really about the sleep paralysis anymore. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I, I, I practiced it for a few months. Uh, the first time I remember the first time that it worked, I had, li I lived with, uh, another family now. Um, I moved around a lot in my early, my late teen, early twenties years. Um, but I remember, so with that family, I, I had gotten it to work. I was upstairs and they were talking quietly downstairs and you, you couldn't really hear conversations, um, from upstairs if people are talking downstairs unless they were talking real loud but whoever was talking was talking real quiet and um it was it was my friend and his mom and i remember when when it had actually worked i felt myself kind of lift up and then i didn't have any control of where i was going and i just kind of went through the floor and downstairs and it only lasted a couple of seconds but it was long enough for me to hear what they were talking about and then I was just immediately like back in my body. And, um, when that happened, I like listened carefully to see if I could hear from upstairs what they were talking about. And I couldn't. So the next day I just happened to, I, I didn't say anything to my friend about it, but I just, I just ha happened to ask, uh, like, Hey, what were you and your mom talking about? And he told me, and it was what I heard. Um, and it wasn't anything like especially important, but it just, it just kind of confirmed to me that, that, that might, it might be real. So then, um, that really got me hooked uh, on it, uh, and I ended up getting my own apartment. And um, I had this, uh, I had this neighbor that he was this old guy, and 
he would constantly come over and tell me to turn my TV down, even if it was, I mean, it could be in the middle of the day, like two o'clock on a Saturday, and he would come and knock on my door and tell me to turn my TV down. Um, he, he, was, he wasn't a very pleasant guy, but uh, he, he wasn't really super mean either, though, but I didn't really get to know him or anything. But um, so one, one night I was doing, trying to get the astral projection thing to work, and, and it did, and I ended up uh, going through the wall into his apartment, and I saw his apartment, and the place was just a disaster. Now, I've never seen the inside of this guy's apartment, but I always assumed that it was probably really nice nice and neat and tidy, um, just because, you know, him telling me to turn my TV down. Like, I don't know, it just I, I just got that sense. I figured, like, he probably has a really clean and tidy apartment. Um uh but he did it, 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 it from what i was seeing it wasn't at all i mean there was like even like kids cereal like all over the counter and like stuff that you wouldn't even think an old person like that would eat uh, and the place was just trashed um it, i mean it looked like a place where like like teenagers would live uh so uh, again it only lasted a few few seconds and um went back into my body and and I thought, okay, well, that probably wasn't real. But uh, the next day, and, and again, he always had his blinds closed. He always had his door closed. I've ne I never saw the inside of, of his apartment. But the next day, I went over there and knocked on his door, and I said, hey, I'm missing uh, some mail. Could you check your, uh, do you, could you look in your mail and see if you got anything that was mine? And And the reason I did that was, I wanted to see his apartment so he said yeah hang on and he so he he left the door open while he went to go get his stack of mail that that he had just come back to the apartment with he was looking through and he said there's there's nothing in here but through that i got a good look at his apartment and it was exactly what i saw it was like i mean right down to the cereal box uh i mean it was it was exactly what i saw and i said okay well thanks anyway and uh so i i, I left and um that that just like pulled me further into it you know now now i'm thinking like wow this is actually real like this is this is almost like a superpower and i was starting to get i mean it, it, it that that's what it does it's like a drug like you you get addicted to it um there was another time i and typ typically i didn't see any other like beings or anything uh, there was only one time that i might have um so i had a in that apartment, I had a, a kitchen that sort of had like, kind of like a like a like a bar area uh, off of the kitchen where where before you went into the kitchen, you could see you know about this much of the kitchen because uh, there was the top part and there was like this this really small kind of bar area. So if you looked into the kitchen through that, you know you could only see like the mid section of the the kitchen. Well, this so this other time. I was trying to astral project and I got out of my body and um, I didn't really know what to do. Like I, I never really had any plans. Like I just wanted, wanted it to work, but I, I kind of floated to the kitchen and I saw some, what I thought was somebody standing in, in the kitchen in like a white, it was almost like a white robe with like some markings on it. And, and I can't really remember what it was like. There was like a sash. Um, and, but it was completely still. And seeing that, it, it just, it startled me. And when I got startled, I, I was immediately back in my body. And so up until, uh, up until a little later, uh, that, that was the only time that I might have seen some kind of entity. I don't know what that was. Um, I definitely saw some later that we'll have to talk, talk about, but I, I, I noticed that when I would go into astral projection, it felt very similar to going into sleep paralysis there's there's almost like a buzziness to it and anybody that's ever felt sleep paralysis you know what that's like it's 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 almost like a tingling or a buzzing or an elect electric like electricity Some, sometimes you can hear buzzing um and going into astral projection was like that it was that same kind of feeling which that should have been a clue for me but at the time i just i didn't i didn't care the sleep paralysis uh, seemed to slow down. Like I wasn't having as many sleep paralysis attacks anymore. Um, and I was completely hooked on astral projection. Like it was a drug. And I, I, I've been so, I had been so deceived that I thought 
like I was really getting into New Age. It wasn't just the astral projection. I was starting to get into some of the teachings. And I actually was so deceived that I thought New Age had some truths that could be incorporated into Christianity. And looking back, this is probably why the sleep paralysis ended up slowing down, because these evil entities knew that they had me where they wanted me. Um, I, I even tried to write a, a book on how Christians could use New Age practices. Um, and I got about halfway through the book, and my, my computer, like, turned off and turned back on, and the file was gone. Only that file, it was gone. And I was so far into it that I knew I wasn't going to start it over again. Like, I don't know if you've ever had that happen, but if you work really hard on something and then it gets it gets ruined somehow, you don't want to start over on that same project because it's it's like you already wrote that, so it's, like, boring. Um, which, by the way, this is just a little tidbit, but if, if you're a writer and you ever have writer's block, it might be because you're telling people about what you're writing. So, to your mind, the story's already told. That's why it's so hard to write. Whenever I write a new project, I don't talk about anything until after it's written. So just just a little tidbit there. But but I so I, I had that that feeling. It's like I, I knew I wasn't gonna start again. I think that was actually God um, not only protecting me but protecting anybody that I I might might have led astray through that that horrible book that I was trying to write. Um, so. Basically, at the time, these entities, these these evil beings, they had me working for them, and I didn't even know it. Uh, and that's probably why the sleep paralysis slowed down to almost nothing. They they the sleep paralysis had already served its purpose to get me into this new age stuff, and now I was essentially working for them. But uh, there would be a time coming soon when they would ask me for a favor. Concerning the economically unstable times that we live in, it is a great idea to convert some of your savings into real money. Now, there is a big difference between real money and what we call money, which is actually just currency. So our dollar is currency, which fluctuates. Real money, on the other hand, like silver, for example, is a store of value over time. The best way to think of it is like this. If you had saved $1,000 in cash back in the late 60s, the late 1960s, that $1,000 would still be $1,000 technically, but it would buy you significantly less today due to inflation. Now, if you had saved that same $1,000 in silver, back in the 1960s. Today, it would be worth around $28,000. So one of the best ways to protect your purchasing power is in real money, more specifically, silver. You can buy and have the metal shipped discreetly to your door, and what most people don't know is that you can actually convert your IRA or even a 401k into physical silver, rather than having all of your life savings tied up in the paper fiat system which is subject to hyperinflation. Go to dailyrenegade.com and click on the Cornerstone Assets Metals banner. This is the only company that I personally trust with this kind of thing. Click on that and sign up to get your free silver report today. One of the financial experts will speak with you to find out the best way to protect your savings going forward in these uncertain times. Now, believe it or not, I met the love of my life at McDonald's. Um, I, I had been working there for a while, and uh, I actually, altogether, I worked at McDonald's for like nine years or something like that. Like it was, um, I, I wasn't a very responsible uh, young adult <laughs> when I was when I was when I was that young. I mean, who who of us are? But uh, but so that was really the only job that. I could do and hold down, but, um, but one day the most beautiful girl that I've ever seen in my life came in and she, uh, she was coming in for a shift. She had just started. She was the new girl. And, um, I just, I immediately, I, I immediately knew there was something special about her. And so we were, uh, I, I'm not, a, I'm not a very, I, 
I've never really been good at like flirting or like, you, you know, like picking up girls or anything like that. I was, I was never really good at that. Um, so we, we actually just ended up becoming really close friends and per, like best friends, uh, for, for a couple of years, we got really, really close. And I, I think that that's actually the best way to do it. If you're trying to find somebody long-term, because, if you're just friends, it takes the pressure off and then you actually get to see the worst side of them and they get to see the worst side of you because you're not trying to impress them. They're not trying to impress you. And then you really know what you're in for. Um, it's not the only way, but th that's it, it worked for me. Uh, so by the time... Uh, by the time I was really feeling like... And there, there's a lot of this story that I'm skipping past, but because um, this isn't just about me and Christina. Uh, but... Um, once it came time to tell her how I felt, you know, I, I, I wanted to, I got, I got some really good encouragement from actually the friend that I told you before that, uh, that thing impersonated and then like sh shook me really bad, really violently. Um, that, that friend, that same friend, and maybe this was why, but that same friend was the one who really, really encouraged me because I, I thought, I thought Christina was out of my league. I had no chance. If I tried to tell her that I liked her like that, it would ruin the friendship that we have. Like I was really down on myself about it. And that friend was the one that like really encouraged me one night, um, that I shouldn't sell myself short like that. I absolutely should go for it. You know, I'm, I'm thinking too little of myself. And he, he really encouraged me. So I, I did end up, I took his advice. I ended up went and for, going for it. And I um, took her to a park one night and told her that I like her as more than a friend. I've come to find out she did too. <laughs> so uh, so that, that night we started dating and uh, it's, it's just been great ever since. Um, now, during our relationship, she, she, she was a Christian too. Um, a lot stronger of a Christian than I was. Um, and she was aware of my new age stuff and kind of tolerated it, but she never practiced in it. Like she never, she never like got into it with me or any, anything like that. Um, so we moved around a lot and we ended up in, uh, two apartments that were next door to each other. And during that time I proposed, I did it in the corniest way possible. Um, she had a cat, a cat that I had gotten her for Christmas, uh, and I put the ring on her collar, on the cat's collar. And um, her name was her name was Sasha. And Christina was playing The Sims on, on the computer at my place. And I was giving her Sasha. I was like, Sasha wants to be pet. You know, she really likes being pet around the neck and stuff. And then and then eventually she, she kind of felt the ring. She's like, what's this? And then, then she noticed that I was down on one knee that whole time. And then I proposed and she cried and said yes and uh and called her mom and told 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 her mom and so then that's that's how we got engaged. Corniest proposal ever, but I don't care, I love it. <laughs> and uh so I knew that it was time for us to start finding uh a place that, that we could live together. Um so we were working we ended up working at uh this this is a little bit later, we ended up working at a McDonald's in uh Highland, Michigan, right next to uh, trailer park and we were so poor at the time um i i knew that we're, we were gonna have to live in the trailer park because the trailers there were cheap um and i only had five hundred dollars to spend on a trailer that that was it which usually you can't you can't find a working trailer for that you can find a busted up one that doesn't have a roof or something but even back then uh there was only one trailer that was intact and was only five hundred dollars, and it was so cheap because a murder had occurred there a few months prior. Um, but again, it was all I could afford, uh, and so and they, you know, they assured me it was in working order. Um, uh, it's weird they didn't let me see the inside of it though. Uh, but so, um, so I, I just I bought it, and I surprised Christina with it later. So. When, after I bought it, that's when we actually got the keys to where we could actually look inside. So this, this, this murder was horrific. Ba basically a, there was a family that lived there and the older brother of this girl named Jessica, uh, assaulted her 
in a way that I can't say on YouTube or they'll take the video down and uh and and killed her stabbed her to death and i think she, she was just a teenager at the time this is absolutely horrible well when we went in when we went in uh we noticed that in the back room there were all of these clothes just piled up and um and we looked at you know the rest of the, the rest of the place was kind of okay it was it was a mess but it was kind of okay but in that in that room and that uh, it was it was like this i get well technically it would be the front room because it was uh the one that was facing the street um i always thought of it as the back room because it was the one opposite from the master bedroom but anyway in that room um there was this big pile of clothes and uh one of our friends was helping us uh move our stuff so we we, we started kind of going through the clothes and we noticed that they were stuck to the floor come to find out nobody had cleaned up the the, the crime scene no no one like the the trailer park oh my gosh the trailer park was horrible uh we found out a lot of things later that caused us to move like they were letting um child abusers and stuff live there they just put them in the back of the park and thought everything would be okay but uh but we um uh the the trailer park did not clean up any of the mess so there was blood all over the place and the only thing they did was all the clothes that the family left behind, they just dumped on the, they just threw on the blood and then they just left it and, it and it was there for months. So obviously that was awful. We we went to, we went to the park management place and told them and they said, well, since I already bought the trailer, it's my responsibility. And they said, just get some kills and put it on there. It'll be fine. Like they were like acting like it wasn't a big deal. So that was absolutely horrific. Uh, so me and Christina and our friend, we got everything into garbage bags, cleaned it up best we could. I mean, it was all over the walls. It was it it, 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 it was bad. It was really bad. Um, so so we got all of that cleaned up, and um, you know, we had found we had found out uh like what what happened in the trailer. They did mention before we bought it, the guy that was showing the trailers, he did mention that this, because I, I asked him, I was like, Is, wasn't there a trailer in here? We had heard something about there was like a murder or something. He's like, yeah, it's this one. That's why it's so cheap. And I was like, okay. So they did disclose that to me, but they didn't tell me that it was still a mess in there. Uh, Again, I mean, I kind of didn't have a choice. I had $500 to my name and Christina and I needed a place to live. And it, it was always going to be that trailer. It had to be. Um. So we had learned more about like the, the grisly details of the the murder, like how horrible it was. The guy that did it was caught, and he's 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 got life in prison now. He's he's not getting out. Um, but I remember one time there because one of the rooms was like this little nursery, and uh, I remember one time I was looking in there, and on the inside upper wall of the closet, I actually saw written Jessica was here. So she she had written that, you know whenever but uh so that 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 was it was just kind of strange finding that and just knowing what happened to her and you know when she wrote that she probably had no idea what what was gonna happen shortly after it was just an absolutely horrible horrible story um and i don't know anything else about what went on i don't know what made the brother do that what made him go crazy uh what i don't i don't know anything about the don't know anything um so so we uh, we got moved in, got the place cleaned up. Uh, we got we got married at the local church there, and then about a year later, we had our first child, uh, our daughter Jackie. Now at first, things seemed pretty normal. There were only a couple of odd things that seemed kind of harmless at the time. So in in the room of the murder, whenever I would take pictures in that room, the pictures would be like covered in orbs. Like if you've ever seen people that take pictures of a graveyard, and sometimes you see a little orb or something, well, it would be like the room would be covered in them. Um, and so that was weird. Uh, and I remember one time me and Christina were heading out and there was this light above our house and she noticed it and she's like, what's that? And I looked at it and I was like, ah, it's probably a satellite or something. Cause it looked too bright to be a star. And I said, it's probably a satellite or maybe a star, you know, I, I don't know. And, and then she was like, no, Josh, I don't think that is. And she was getting a really bad feeling from it. And I, 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 you know, I had never seen a UFO or anything before, so I, I wasn't thinking that at all. And I, and I was like, well, you know, we're going to be gone for a couple hours. Um, it 
uh, if it if it's just a star or or you know a satellite or something, um, or well, it, okay. So we had watched it long enough that I knew it wasn't a satellite because satellites you can typically you can see the move, and this one wasn't. Uh, so I was like, okay, we're not going to be gone that long. If it's just a star, it'll still be here when we get back. If it's gone, then maybe that's something weird. Maybe. Um, so we left, we came back, and it was gone. And uh, so I wasn't really, I wasn't really scared about it or anything. Like I, I really didn't think anything about it. I thought, okay, maybe it was just a satellite, and we just didn't see it move, and or, or maybe it, I mean it could have been any number of things. Um, Christina has seen UFOs before, and she was convinced that that's what it was. Um, so I was like, well, I don't know. And I just didn't really give it much thought. Well, that, that night I fell asleep and I had the worst nightmares, uh, about like aliens and, and Christina was having them too. And I've never, I've never had nightmares like that before. Um, and, and again, I wasn't afraid of the, like the light, like I didn't think it was a UFO. So I, I don't think that that influenced my nightmares, but we just had one really bad night of nightmares about like aliens grabbing us and stuff. And then, uh, and then after that, it was that was it. That 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 was like the whole thing to that story. That that's the, that's the end of it. Um, and uh, there there was another night where I was asleep, but I guess I was talking with Christina as if I were awake, like eyes open and everything. And I'm not prone to sleepwalking or anything. Um, but I have no memory of this, and uh, I guess it kind of creeped Christina out when she told me the next day. But um, but the, these things were really few and far between at this time, so I didn't really think much of them. So I was still into New Age and astral projection. I still considered myself a Christian because I never denied Jesus outright. But looking back, I certainly wasn't living for him either. So the thing that really, the thing that really, like, it was like a light switch was on and now I'm living in a demonically infested trailer. Uh, what had happened was um, there's this, this one day, it's just mid-afternoon, um, I was meditating, trying to, uh, trying to leave my body and, and I managed to and I floated outside through the wall floated outside and I turned towards the street and I saw I saw all of these I, I guess you just call them entities I don't know what to call them because they all looked different um, some looked like people some looked like monsters but they, they were like all over uh, the, the street some were like on the rooftop, some were walking in the street, walking through yards, and they were all headed towards this big, it just looked like a big, like bright, like light, like a bright, big, circlish thing. Um, like maybe a portal or something, but it was like, they were all walking towards this thing. And there was a, there was a group of them, about five or six of them maybe, that were closest to me, uh, walking down, down the street towards it. So I went up to them and, like a couple of them looked human, a couple of, a couple of them looked like monsters, and but I wasn't like I wasn't afraid. Like to to me, and it's it's weird, but to me at the time it was as normal as just going up to somebody at the grocery store, a stranger at the grocery store, and saying, "Hey, do you know where the Kansas Soup are? You, you know, uh, you know which aisle this is in." So, um, I but I asked I asked them, um, hey, what, "What's what's going on? What is this all about?" And they didn't answer me, but they, uh, w at least one of them, and maybe one other, at least one of them seemed like he, he didn't want to talk to me. They were too busy. He just didn't want to deal with it. And he's like, "Come on, guys, let's let's go." But uh, but the other one seemed really, really, really interested in me. And they didn't give me any answers of anything, but they were asking about me, and they were they were asking like, uh, you know, are you basically are you from here or? Or, you know, they were asking me what I was. And I was like, oh, no, I'm a, I'm a person. I'm just a human being. I'm astral projecting right now. And they seemed to really like that. They seemed, like, really interested. And then they said, well, you know, I know that that can be difficult sometimes. If you ever need any help, you can ask us. If, you, if, you're, if you're not able to leave your body, you can ask us, and we'll help you leave your body. And there was just something about that, you know, the... the they seemed pleasant when they were saying that, so it, I didn't, like, get the creeps, but I was really suspicious of it because there was just something, again, probably from my Christian upbringing, there was just something that seemed off. There was just something where I was, I didn't like the idea of that. It was, like, too close to, like, 
praying to something that wasn't God. And, and I, I at least knew enough to know that that was wrong. Um, and, and again, I wasn't thinking that these were demons or anything. I didn't, I didn't know what they were. I, I wasn't thinking they were demons. I thought that they were just some spiritual beings that I just wasn't aware of. And I said, okay, well, I'll, I'll keep that in mind. Uh, I got, I got to go back now. And, and so I left, went back to my body. Well, the next time that I had tried to, uh, astral project, I couldn't like, I, I, and it, it's not like that I could every single time. So that wasn't, it was, that wasn't unusual for me to not be able to do it. Um, but, uh, but I, I mean, I couldn't get anywhere in like meditation or just anything it just wasn't working. And then I remembered what they said that if I ever needed help, they would help me, but I decided against it because I was just too uncomfortable with it. Um, so I decided that I was not going to do that. I just stopped my meditation. I just went about my day. Well, after that, and it wasn't long after that, but after that, literally all hell broke loose uh, in, in the trailer. Um, I mean, it was like the gates of hell were opened right in our trailer. And it was, I mean, we were just getting constant, like, attacks and activity. So, so I was get my sleep paralysis came back full force. I was getting it all the time again, almost every night now. Um, and it was way more vivid and it, 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 it could happen at any time. Like it could be, I, I would just like lay down to rest and watch TV and bam, sleep paralysis. This one time, middle of the day, um, I, uh, I had, I was kind of facing this way again, like, um, and the, the, the spot in the bed next to me where Christina usually was, was empty. Um, cause it was just me, but, but I noticed sitting right, like on her pillow was this like large, I don't know how to describe it. It was almost like a lizard creature, like a humanoid lizard thing. And it wasn't looking directly at me. It was looking past me and it had this incredibly huge, creepy, awful smile with all these teeth, like these sharp teeth. And, and, and it, it wasn't looking directly at me. It was looking past me, but it was so still like there was no movement, almost like it was like a statue, but I knew that it, I knew that it was like real. I knew that that, that was, it was a being of some kind. Um, and I'm curious to know, like for those of you who have had sleep paralysis, do you ever get that where sometimes they're just really still like statues? Um, I'm curious to know about that. Cause that happens with me from, from time to time, but it's like, I knew it wasn't like a statue. I knew that it wasn't inanimate. It was just, really still and sitting like just kind of crouched over me uh right right next to my head um so that was like really vivid there there were other times w one of them that i would see a lot and this is going to sound kind of silly and a lot a lot of times these things sound silly when you retell them but when you go through it it's it's not um there there was this this other one that i would see frequently uh, and again it would always be really really still but it was almost like this large, tall dog, but it was like unnaturally tall. Like the legs were tall and the, the, the body was kind of like, like a large dog size, like normal dog size, but the legs were just really thin and tall. And that, that thing would be standing by my bed too, not really looking at me, but it would be just perfectly still like a statue. And it had like floppy ears, just like a, like not, it didn't even like if you, I don't know breeds of dogs, but if you saw that kind of, that, that breed of dog without the long legs thing, but just as normal, like you would never be threatened by it. Um, and, uh, but there's just something awful about it and unnatural. Um, so I, I would see that frequently. Christina and I were both having the same sleep paralysis experiences, like a shared experience. Um, there was one, one of them, one of the mo more prominent ones, we had both gotten into sleep paralysis and, uh, and this was at night and we saw this little figure about this, this tall, really spindly, skinny, um, this really small, like legs that were kind of legs and arms that were a little too long for the proportion of its body. Um, and it was jumping all over our dressers and knocking stuff over and we were hearing it we were hearing this stuff knock over and it was like messing messing up our, our stuff and knocking everything over until it left and then once it left we were out of it but all the stuff was on the floor like it it, it, it was like like it was actually happening and we both saw 
and we both described the same exact thing um, at the same time. <clears throat> so that kind of stuff was happening. I had never had that happen before. Um, our daughter was having night terrors, which she had never had night terrors before. But, I mean, I, I remember one time it was so bad, she just started screaming. And she was always a good sleeper. But the middle of the night, she just started screaming. And we went in there, and it was late. And um, we got her out, and she was shaking and screaming and crying. And this was totally unlike her. We got, we got her out of the crib. We were holding her, and it took forever to calm her down. It took a really long time. And she had never, I mean, she was in full, like, night terror mode. And she was, like, really, really young. So, of course, she couldn't tell us what, what had happened. But she, she was really scared. Um, and by the way, she never had those before, and since we got everything taken care of, which I'll, I'll get into how that happened, but, uh, she's never had those since. So it was just this completely weird freak thing. Um, we had, for a little while, we had an atheist roommate, and, um, it was a friend from work that just needed some help, and so, uh, we were helping her out. She was staying with us, and, um, but she was, she was even seeing orbs, and she didn't believe in any of this stuff. She was even seeing orbs flying around, and she said that she would get the most sinister, awful feelings from these things when she would see them, and she would see them, like, go into me and Christina's room. Um, we would we started seeing uh, uh, black shadow, black shadow people, I guess. They're called now. I just, I think they're probably just demons, but, like, shadow people. They're, they're like, they look like a humanoid figure, but they're like a three-dimensional shadow of, like, thick shadow. Uh, almost, almost solid. Um, but we would see these black shadow people run past our windows in the middle of the day, like our living room window, middle of the day, 11 o'clock in, in the morning, we're watching TV and we, we'd see these things just like run by. And then when we'd go look outside, we didn't, we didn't see anything. Um, there was, uh oh, there was, there was one time where, uh, me, the roommate and Christina were watching TV it's probably about five or six at, at, at night, so not too late. But all of a sudden, we heard what sounded like a bomb going off in the bathroom. I, I thought the water heater exploded or something. I mean, this was so loud. Um, it, it scared us to death. It was so loud. I right like when, Once it stopped, I ran in there, and nothing was out of place. Nothing had fallen. Nothing blew up. Nothing was out of place. Um and uh, we had asked our uh, no no one else in the neighborhood heard anything because nobody came came over to to check on us or or anything like that. Um, our our neighbors never noticed anything strange. Um, we were close with our neighbors. Um, there was there was another time I was just laying in bed. This was in the morning. Uh, I had just woken up, um, and I was just kind of laying there, just thinking about getting ready for the day, you know, but I was just kind of laying there totally awake. And then, um, out of nowhere, I hear this really loud grinding metallic sound that sounded like it came from the sky right outside of my bedroom window, like 10, 15, 20 feet up. You know, you can't really tell by sound, but it sounded close. Like it didn't sound like some far off distant thing. It was really like a loud grinding metal sound. And I, that was another thing I never heard before or since. And I think on that one, I even posted a Facebook post and said, hey, anybody in my area, did you hear like any kind of metal sound? And nobody heard anything. Um, I had this uh, this um, little statue. It was a bust of Zeus. And I, I know, I, it's stupid stuff. But um, I had that in that uh, in that room where the murder occurred. I had it up on a shelf, and it was, it was heavy, so it was really secure. Um, well, I heard this loud crashing in there one day, so I went and checked, opened the door, um, and it looked like the thing had been thrown across the room, and it was all broken. It didn't just fall, and it was, I mean, this it was heavy and big, and I had had it for, for a while. Um, there, there wasn't anything that would have just made it fall. Um, it looked like it had been thrown, like, and, and shattered on the ground. Even if it were to fall from that shelf, I mean, it was a big piece of rock. Like, it, it shouldn't have just shattered like that, but... So that that happened. Um, so this stuff kept increasing so bad. I mean, the, the the worst stuff was the sleep paralysis stuff, the demonic attacks we were getting, the night terrors my daughter was getting, um, the 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 roommate that we had was being harassed, and um, she ended up moving out for other reasons. But uh, 
but while she was there like it, it just it got so bad and my, my family was being attacked it absolutely broke me um and i i had realized what had happened i had realized those things wanted me to ask them for help. They wanted my permission to get me out of my body. For what reason? I don't know. Uh, I don't know exactly, but maybe they wanted to possess me or maybe they wanted to, I, I don't know, but they, they wanted that, that type of prayer to them. They wanted that almost type of worship to them. And I, I think that if I were, if I were to allow them to do that, I probably would have started thinking they were my spirit guides or something. Um, and they would have had even more hold over me. Um, I, and I think that that's what their goal was. Um, but I had denied them that, and they were really angry. And I had no doubt it was those it was those same entities and probably even more that were that were messing with uh, me and Christina. And you know th those things they can make themselves look like different things. So just because you know what we saw looked different than you know, what I encountered that day, it doesn't mean that they weren't the same. I, I just got the distinct feeling that they were really, really, really angry and they were taking it out on me that I didn't give them what they wanted. And I had no idea what to do about it. So at, at that point, I was realizing I had made a terrible, awful mistake and I couldn't do anything about it. Um, so it, it just absolutely broke me. Um, I prayed, I prayed to God and I prayed for help, like genuinely prayed for help. And I said, God, I, I don't know what to do. Clearly I've made a really bad mistake here. Um, so, so I asked for help. I, uh, you know, nobody, nobody was really sleeping all that well during those, during those weeks or months or however long it was. And, um, so one, one morning, uh, I was flipping through the TV and I saw a show that I hadn't heard about before, and it was on a Christian channel. And this was during the days of TiVo, <laughs> so uh, um, so I was flipping through that, and it's called it was called It's Supernatural with Sid Roth, and it was on a Christian channel. And I just decided, hey, supernatural stuff, you know, why why not? So I, I clicked on it, and the episode was with uh, L.A. Marzuli, who many of you know today, and if you don't, you should look him up because he's awesome. Um, and re remember when I, I said at the beginning of this, this, uh, account, remember when I said that there were other things that I would ask the pastor, like about aliens and stuff that I was really interested in theologically, and I could never get a straight answer out of anybody. Well, in this show, it immediately hooked me because LA was talking about aliens in the Bible. And he was talking about Genesis six and the watchers. And he was talking about all this stuff that like, it really, it really hit me. Like it connected. I had never heard the word Nephilim before that day. Um, I, I didn't really give any thought to Genesis six or the giants or anything like that before that day. This was my introduction to this. And he was, he was talking about aliens and stuff. Well, in that same program, he was talking about his testimony as well, how he came out of new age, how, uh, how, how, you know, he, he was in it and he was deceived by this stuff and how he, he came out of it and, and became a uh, Christian. So, um, I didn't know LA or anything, you know, to me, he's a guy on TV, so he's famous. And I looked up his website and there was a contact, uh, email. And so I just took a chance and I emailed him and basically I told him what, what was going on. And I asked him when he came out of new age, did he, you know, was it because he was being attacked or like, were, were there attacks and what, what did he do about it? Um, well, he, uh, the next day, his, his wife, Peggy emailed me back and said, Hey, you know, this is LA's wife, Peggy. Um, he's on the road right now and, and can't, uh, but he, he wants to call you. Would you, would you be open to a phone conversation? And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, of course. And I remember like that night too, the, the night before the phone call. So the, the day that I sent the first email, when Christina came home from work, I had TiVo'd that and I said, you got to watch this with me right now. And she sat down, we watched it together and it just, I mean, it opened both of our eyes. And so, um, and so we started looking up more of LA stuff and everything. And then, then I wrote the email. And so the next day, so Peggy wrote that and I said, yes, absolutely. I would, I would love to do that. Here's my phone number. Um, and 
Uh, so she gave it, she gave it time and everything. And so, uh, LA called me and I, m- I remember when I told Christina, I was like shaking. I was like, LA Marzulli actually wants to call me and talk to me on the phone. And it's so funny now because he and I are really good friends now. Like we're, we're, we're really close. And it's, it's just funny that like, I, I used to think of him as like this big unapproachable celebrity and, um, you know, really he's just a regular person like, like you or me, but, but, uh, but he, he, he called me and it absolutely changed my life. This is why I'm in ministry today. Um, he called me and he, I, I told him everything that had happened and, and he gave me a real brief uh, crash course on spiritual warfare. And he said, well, you need to understand every time you leave your body, you're, ba- you're basically opening a portal that's allowing these things to come in. Like you're, you're, you're giving them permission to, to tread on your ground. Uh, and the further you get away from God, the, the more these, these cracks and these breaks happen. You know, if you're not under God's protection, you're basically giving these things permission to do whatever they want to you. So what you need to do is you need to recognize, for one thing, you need to denounce everything new age. You need to, you know, rededicate your life to Christ. You need to serve Christ. And uh, if you do that, you'll have access to his authority. And he's like, you know, you got to know it's not your authority that's doing anything. It's the authority of Jesus. But the only way to have access to that, you know, you, you got you got to be in his family. Um. And, uh, you know, you gotta, you gotta want Jesus and you gotta want to not have anything to do with this stuff anymore. You know, you, you've, you've got to completely denounce anything new age. You, you know, you can't be astral projecting. You can't, you can't be doing any of this. Um, and he said, you know, you can, he's like, you can have an open Bible with you, or you can have some oil. Just again, no, it's not the book or the oil that's actually doing anything. But, uh, what you need to do is go around your house, every single room, and even do it outside the house and you need to uh, banish everything out of it in the name of Jesus. Say, you know, something along the lines of like, in the name of Jesus, I command you to leave. This is the house of God. He said, uh, you know, you can anoint the doorposts with oil um, and, and uh, you know, pr- pray over it and everything. He said, but again, the oil isn't what's doing it. It's it's the authority of Jesus. It's just whatever you need to do. Um, and he, he said, you know, before you do that though, you need to get everything new age out of your house and in the garbage. And uh, he said, go, go through all, all, all the rooms in your house and do that. Uh, dedicate your house uh, and your property to God. Um, totally denounce Satan and all of his minions. Uh, and, and also use the name of Jesus to close any portals you may have opened. And you need to do that in every room. So I said, okay. And uh, we got off the phone. So... Um, so I did immediately, I immediately rededicated my life to, to Jesus. I threw away all my new age materials. Um, and then, uh, the, the day that I was going to cleanse the house, I didn't know what to expect. You know, I'm thinking, you know, something out of a horror movie or something. And and it, it wasn't exactly that, but, um, but I didn't know what to expect. So I got everyone out of the house that, Hey, you know, go, go to the store for a couple of hours. I'll call you when I'm done or however long it, it didn't take a couple hours, but it's just, go to the store for a while and I'll, I'll give you a call when I'm done. And then I did what LA told me to do to cleanse the trailer. I went in every room and I said, like, in the name of Jesus, I, uh, I, I command any evil entities, any, any beings that aren't, um, that aren't, uh, 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 submissive to God. I command you out in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I, I command any portal that I may have opened or any portal that is open to be closed in the name of Jesus. Now, while this was going on, and I had a, I had a Bible open with me, and, you, know, you know, I wasn't really reading from it. I just wanted to have it. Um, I didn't feel anything while I was doing this until I went into the, the last room. And once I got through the last room, um, everything in the trailer just felt lighter. It felt brighter. Uh, it was just a lot lighter. It didn't feel so oppressively spiritually heavy. It, it's hard to explain unless you felt it, but it just, it just felt, it just felt nice. Like probably for the first time ever. Um, and, and again, while I was going through it, while, while I was doing it, I didn't notice anything happening, but after I was done and the lighter feeling happened, I got sick. Like I got really sick. I, I felt weak. I, I felt like I, I felt like I was feeling the aftermath of like getting hit by a truck. Like I, I felt so horrible, like just so, and I was not expecting that. And it got, it got so bad. I, I had to take that day off from work. I had to call into work that day and stay home and, and, and just rest. Cause I was so sick uh, and just wore out. And 
I, I think what happened was while I was going through it, I believe that Jesus was right there with me. I believe the Holy Spirit was right there with me, keeping me strong to the point where I wasn't even feeling if there was any backlash coming from the enemy, I wasn't feeling it. But once everything lifted and once the job was done, then I felt like the aftermath of it, like, wow, I really had, I really was through a battle. Like I really went through a battle just now. Um, and I had never felt that before. <clears throat> so, um, so after, after that, all the activity stopped and life, uh, life went to normal, really. I, I don't even want to say back to normal because it went to normal for the first time ever. Um, we lived there a little while longer. Uh, yeah. So all the activity and the sleep paralysis, uh, pretty much stopped. Um, I say pretty much cause it's something I'm going to talk about in a minute, but, uh, but all, all of the activity in the house just ceased. It was done. Um, Jackie was not having any more night terrors. We weren't getting sleep paralysis or loud noises or, or anything. The cats weren't freaked out all the time like they used to be. Um, nothing was happening. Nothing weird was happening in that room. Like it just, it just felt like it kind of, it just felt like a normal trailer. So we lived there for a while longer and ended up uh, moving for work. And we didn't, we didn't tell the new owners about anything that happened because uh, we learned, we learned pretty early on that they weren't religious. I don't remember how I probably said, Oh, and if you guys like church, there's a really nice church that we go to. And I, they probably said something like they're not religious. I don't remember exactly how we found out, but we found out pretty early on that they weren't religious and so we figured well the problem solved anyway so it really wasn't worth bringing up um and so we didn't but uh but a couple of months later i got a phone call from the new owners and they actually asked me if anything strange had ever happened in the trailer while we were living there and i was like well what what do you mean what's happening and um and they they were hearing disembodied voices outside. Their child was having uh, night terrors and other things that were really similar to what we experienced. And so at that time, I told them everything. And I, I told them everything that had happened. I told them the whole story, the same story I'm telling you today. And I told them that the only way to stop it is that they, they have to give their lives to Jesus. Like they, if they want the, the authority of Jesus, I, I, you, you got to give your lives to Jesus. You got to know that Jesus is real. Um, and, uh, you know, you got to pray to him, re repent, ask for forgiveness, you know, the, the whole salvation thing. And, uh, and I, and I told him, I said, there really is no other way to get rid of this stuff. Believe me, I've tried, nothing will work and it's only going to get worse. But, um, but you know, you got to understand if, if these things are real, God is real too. And God has provided a way out. Uh, but if you, if you keep, if you keep denying him, these things are just going to get worse now. And, you know, they politely thanked me and, and got off the phone. Now, I never found out if they took my advice or not. I, I don't know what happened. Uh, so a while later I had actually found out that that trailer had been bulldozed. So they must've moved out at some point and I don't know what happened to them, but, uh, sometime after that, that trailer had been bulldozed. So it doesn't, doesn't exist anymore, which I suppose is a, a fitting end to the most demonic place I have ever lived. Um, so that's basically the whole story. The main point is the ultimate authority lies with Jesus, but we can't have access to that if we're not a part of his family. Um, just like a child doesn't have access to the authority of uh, somebody else's dad, right? You know, you, you, you got to pick who your family is. Um, if you pick nobody, then your family's the enemy and you just don't know it. Um, but if you want, if you want to have access to the authority of Jesus, and if you're going through this and, and you, you want this stuff to stop, that really is the only way. Um, the further away that we are from God, the more authority we are giving up to evil spirits who will do anything and everything to keep us from God. We don't hold any authority at all. Uh, we only have access to Jesus if, if if we, if, if, if he's our savior, you know, if we accept him as our savior, he's the only way to heaven. He's the only way to have anything good happen after this life. Um, but the reason that these beings do this, it's not only to deceive you into hell. They do this to expand th their kingdom of darkness. So there's two kingdoms and the earth is kind of like a battlefield. There's the kingdom of God you know, that, that's, that's heaven, there's the kingdom of God, and, and on earth, we can see that in Christians. That doesn't mean that every Christian is perfect. No Christian is perfect. Not a single one. Um, we all have our flaws. The only difference between Christians and non-Christians is who are you, who are you ser serving? Who, who's your savior? Is your savior yourself? 
Or is it somebody greater than you who actually has the authority to save you, and there's only one, and that's Jesus? Um, well, the enemy, they also have places on earth that they want to keep. They have demonic strongholds, and they want to gain more ground. And they do that by deceiving Christians or just keeping people away from Christianity uh, because of exactly what happened in the trailer. They gained ground when I let those things in. And now, yeah, I did it unknowingly, but I was disobeying God for sure with everything that I was doing. And I wasn't taking time to read the Bible and learn what God actually wants for my life. I just, I was living for myself. And because of that, I was allowing these things in and they gained that ground. They gained a little extra piece towards their kingdom of darkness. It's like two armies. And when I cleansed that trailer and when I denounced those things and said, like, no, I'm not going to serve you. I'm not going to ask you to help me you know, further disobey God. Well, like once I made that decision and I prayed to Jesus and uh, rededicated my life to him and, and said, Jesus, I am yours. I will never touch new age ever again or anything else. I, I just, I just want, I just want the truth. I just want you and whatever that truth is, I will conform to that truth. Um, I'm not going to conform your truth to something that I would prefer. Uh, and w once I had made that decision, and cleanse that trailer, the kingdom of darkness lost some battleground to their enemy, which is the kingdom of God. So we are in a war. And if you're not a warrior, then you're a prisoner of a war that you don't even know exists, just like I just like I was. So don't make the same mistakes and ignore this stuff. Your eternity and the eternity of many other people around you uh, depend on it, because you never know how big of an influence you have. Again, I am only in ministry today because of everything that had happened. Um, that that's that's my testimony. That's what brought me to Jesus, and that's why that that's why I got into ministry. Um, you know, Jesus really used L.A. Uh, Marzuli in my life. I wanted to do conferences and write books and do movies and stuff, just like he he was and is now. And now I get to do that. And um, and it's not about just you know having fun being on TV and stuff. Uh, it's not it's not about that. It's about like the the more that I can do this, the more I can hopefully warn people so they don't have to learn from the same mistake that I that I did. Uh, I, I much prefer people to learn from my mistake than have to learn from their own because there's a lot of people that make these mistakes and they never get out of it. Uh, they just they just keep getting into it further to the point where they do deny Christ. And so I'm very thankful for, for Jesus that that, uh, that it didn't happen that way and it happened the way that it happened. And um, But, yeah main point learn from my mistake um and if if you know anybody who is into new age or who has problems with sleep paralysis or hauntings or demonic attacks or anything like that send them this video um now there is more to talk about because uh like i mentioned i i did end up getting uh sleep paralysis a couple more times before i learned how to stop it forever and i do want to talk about that um, but first, I just got some uh, pretty exciting news that I got to tell you about. This There's this uh, upcoming event that you're not going to want to miss, especially if you're a Christian and you're really into prophecy. And if you're not, hey, just try it out. You might end up liking it. Um, but the uh, the link, uh, so it's a prophecy conference. The, the, the link and the special promo code is available in the description below. Uh, and here's here's some more. Here's a little bit more information about it. It's from our friends, our very good friends at Prophecy Watchers, and it's called the Orlando Prophecy Summit. I do believe their live tickets are sold out, but what this promo code is for is for on-demand um, and for streaming live. And it's from February 29th to March 3rd. So if you're viewing this on the Daily Renegade website, then you only got a couple of days uh, before the live event starts. Um, if you're watching this later on YouTube, this will be a couple weeks after. Uh, don't worry because the archives are still there. You can still, uh, it's on demand for quite a while. So, um, uh, so you can, you can sign up and get, get this. I mean, it, it's like 30 something speakers, 30 something prophecy messages from, uh, all the experts in the field. Uh, and it's a really great deal. So, uh, I'm going to read a little bit from their website. Uh, so, one amazing weekend, February 29th to March 3rd, destination Orlando, Florida. Now, now again, keep in mind, that's for the in-person stuff. All of these, um, all of these uh, conference, these speeches, whatever, presentations, all of these presentations uh, are going to be available 
on demand through the link and the promo code in the description below. So it says the Orlando Prophecy Summit will literally change your life and how you view world events in light of Bible prophecy. This is what I was talking about at the Kingdom of Light and the Kingdom of Darkness. These are the kinds of things that these people talk about. And all of these speakers, I, 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 the ones that I'm familiar with, I'm familiar with, I think, almost all of them. Um, I fully support and, and endorse. They're, they're great. The conference features the leading voices in the world of Bible prophecy, and we're anxious to introduce you to new speakers we've never had before. We'll take an in-depth look at what's happening in America, Israel, and around the world, and show that everything is lining up perfectly with Scripture. You, you, scripture. You'll be blessed with solid teachings and the opportunity to meet like-minded believers from literally all over the world. Space is limited, so make your reservation today. Um, now, again, where, where it's not limited is in the on-demand. You, you, you can get the on-demand uh, and, and live stuff now. Um, so, uh, here are some of the speakers. You got Mondo Gonzalez, uh, Tom Hughes, Billy Crone, Mark Henry, um, let's see, L.A. Marzulli is going to be speaking, Bill Salas, uh, Bill Koenig, Larry Olison, um, who I actually had never met before, but I actually had a really good phone conversation with him, uh, a couple of months ago, and he seems just like the nicest guy in the world, like, um, I'm I'm kind I'm familiar with his name I I, I kind of know who he is but I had never met him before he had he's writing a book and he had some questions about some uh, quantum physics things this is one of my it's one of one of my interests and so we had a good talk for about an hour or so and uh, he he was great to talk to um, we got uh, Lee Brainer Dr Andy Woods uh, Carl Tykrib Dr Tommy Ice um, Matt Freeman uh, lot lots of people. Uh, I also have a link if you want to check out more about like the topics. It's it's a lot of prophecy stuff, a lot of similar stuff to what we're, we we talk about on this channel. Um, but it's orlandoprophecysummit.com, and that can be found um, in the link below as well. But uh, you want to sign up and get uh, go ahead and get the on demand thing. The link will take you to your customer information where you can create an account and then complete an order, and there will be a place to put your promo code. And the promo code is. Um, all one word, Peck Orlando 24. Uh, I don't know. The way that it was sent to me is all caps. So I assume that that might matter. Um, so all caps, P E C K O R L A N D O 2 4. The number two and the number four. Um, so that's the promo code. And you absolutely should check that out. Because, uh, I mean, let's be honest, Prophecy Watchers gives the best conferences. My first conference that I ever spoke at was a Prophecy conf uh, Prophecy Watchers conference. And the topic was extra-dimensional UFOs. And it was funny because it, it, the, the, room pa the room was packed. Uh, every seat was filled and people were even sitting in the hallway. There, there, it, even got, it even got to the point where like a fight had broken out and security had to get involved because there, there was like a fight about like seating because they, they, wanted, they wanted to come in and see the presentation. So, I mean, uh, Prophecy Watchers has like the best um, conferences uh, in, in like all, all of Christianity, I, th I think, uh, in, my, in my opinion. Um, so check that out in the link below. Um, okay. Where were we at? Um, yeah, there, okay. So there, I did have a couple more sleep paralysis attacks in the years following that, uh, before I was able to get it to stop forever that, um, that I'd like to talk about one involving apparently the spirit of antichrist. Um, and, a, and, and, and also a really effective method if you're suffering from sleep paralysis. Uh, but we're going to talk about that in the members only section. Now, just very, a very short explanation. If you can't afford a membership, cause I don't want to deprive people of information. And if you're, if you're suffering from sleep paralysis and you've tried saying in the name of the Lord, in the name of Jesus, that, you know, you know, go away, you know, whatever you try praying and it just, it, it isn't working. Um, just a really short explanation um, is when you cast these things out in the name of Jesus uh, in the name of Jesus banish them to the bottomless pit as well as uh, you know and do that in Jesus name now I will get into all of that in the members only section on, on why that why that works and what it means um, but I, I just wanted to at least put the information out there uh, and of course if you have any questions you can always email me Josh Peck disclosure at gmail.com um, and uh, I'll do my best to, to help. But 
If you haven't had a chance already, head on over to dailyrenegade.com and get a membership to get uh, full videos not available anywhere else. It's only $10 a month or $100 a year. And if you can do it, I suggest getting the year because it's $20 cheaper. Um, and essentially, you get two months for free when compared to the monthly subscription. So again, that is dailyrenegade.com. That is also linked in the description below if you're watching for free on YouTube or Rumble. Okay, so if you're watching on the Daily Renegade website, hold on the line. Uh, you don't have to do anything. we got a lot more to talk about. Everyone viewing for free, thank you so much. And until next time, love you all. Take care and God bless.